It's time to go walkies on day four. Well, there's no chance of getting lost here, is there? Straight on this way. It's the most beautiful morning. It's still cool, but it will warm up. Another Pellegrino on his way. Don't know how far he's going. Some others heading in this direction. But this is very interesting. This is uh, obviously, it's an information board um, indicating this rather splendid, tall, proud, feathered bird is a uh, is around these parts and because it's in Braille this is the Camino this is the way walk in it the Pellegrino bird is named because of no I'm making it up but the thing that I notice is it invites touch so you know we use our eyes to see but blind people use a different sense to see they can they can trace the outline of the bird i'm going to, and then there's all the feathers i'm going to close my eyes now and see if i can trace the outline with my finger without cheating so yes it could be a could be a well i've seen it so i can't really tell you but it's certainly the outline of a an animal anyway you get the drift it's very thoughtful to have put that there i have to say this is a very lovely and unusual al alberge hostel and there's a giant sculpted hand in the garden and a sort of Japanese style or French style Monet bridge there. It's just unusual aspects on the Camino. Hola. Look, what a lovely setting. Oh, I wouldn't mind staying here next time. He's a, an interesting fellow. I think very common on Lanzarote. I think you would call this a gecko here. Not quite sure. Lovely, quiet, peaceful. You can hear the birds if I stop yakking. And the crow. It's still before nine o'clock. There's another alberge there. See that sign below it? The cross. Well, that's not the Camino cross. I've only discovered yesterday by the canal that in fact there's a north-south route also, which is, I can't remember exactly the name of it, but there's also a different route, north-south, which uh, cuts across the east-west Camino. And they intersect at various places, and so that route has its own uh, giftware and uh, its symbol, its logo, if you like. Very interesting. Why don't you create your own Camino in your own backyard or your own town or countryside or to a place I walked, like I did once. I walked with Ed from Sheffield back, well, back to my roots, not Ed. Ed's from Sheffield, but we walked took us three weekends and that was like a pilgrimage I tell you it's a wonderful thing to go for a long walk back to your origins so you can create your own Camino either in your back garden or going back home Desi design a logo for it Make some giftware. <laughs> do, it, do it yourself pilgrimage. <laughs> Just another idea. What a lovely...
quiet place this is. I know it's Good Friday, but there's a church on the hill, Iglesia Santa Maria Magdalena. And uh, look at this, this flat, this, this with the balcony and the, the sunrise, the sunflowers. I'll just zoom in, see if you can see that. Sunflowers on the balcony. How delightful. Could, could live here. No, I couldn't because it, it's right by the main road. And I have vowed as far as possible, I will not uh, live by a main road again. I did that in Bakewell for two years. So I was talking about the two routes. That's of course the yellow clamshell of the Camino. I was talking about the other north-south route and that's the symbol there on the brickwork and I might lose half an hour here but I am very attracted to the idea of seeing this Ermita del Socorro from the 12th century so let's just have a I think it's just this here so we don't have to go too far it would be great if there was a coffee shop attached <laughs> Ah oh dear, easily distracted. My walk, I think the path goes there. So look at this, this is the 12th century. Oh, is it abierto? Ah, so it is open and we can go inside and and so lovely lovely oh my goodness me look how lovely this is some ancient relics probably from the, about the same time, I imagine. I don't know what these are. I think this means don't sit here because, well, keep your distance. And so, my friends, I'm going to do a little meditation here. Now thank we all our God with hearts and minds and voices. Oh, it's gone out. <laughs> that one's done. That one's done. This is turning into an Eddie Izzard on the Death Star choosing a tray. That one's wet. <laughs> um, oh, that one. The, the the wick itself is not burning. Is there another one? No. Oh, that's a bad sign, isn't it? The only candle there is for me. Maybe I blew it out when they blew, blew the match out. <laughs> Say a little prayer on this Good Friday morning. 
for redemption from the mistaken identity as separate from God. This is the original sin, separation. We've become lost in the thought of a separate I am instead of una chispa, a spark of the divine, like this candle. And it's the same for everyone. Amen. One little candle shining amidst the brightness of the divine light. That's how it is. That's how it seems to me. We have even found our first morning coffee on the way after visiting La Ermita and this ever nice Camarero is, uh, is producing his morning jamón de Serrano. Lomo. Lomo, lo, lomo, pardon. And we have this lovely cafe with super coffee and a banana. And he even has supplied me with the sun cream I needed. Oh, what a delight. And here, in this little village on the way, next next to the Ermita, the, the 12th century chapel that, that just there, there is one of these uh, lovely drinking fountains of Fuente for the Pellegrinos. I'm absolutely, I'm loving this little, this little village. I don't know what it's called, I'll look it up. I am a bit of a, a nomad. In one of my journals, I once wrote, I know who I am when I am walking. And all of the, shall we say, the baggage of everyday life is uh, very secondary. Well, out of sight, out of mind, I guess. But when I visit a lovely little village like this, I think you get the flavour of it. I'm so quick to say, oh, I could live here. And I don't know how long, well, after Brexit, I could only live here for 90 days at a time. Thank you, my friends who voted for Brexit. Talk about self-harm. No, I shan't go there. I'll take that back on a good Friday. But uh, of course, we all do that when we go on holiday, don't we? But perhaps to other parts of Spain or Italy or Greek island, we say, oh, I could live here. But we, we seem to prefer the familiar. And then what would I do? And <laughs> honestly, uh, it, the question brought a big smile to my face at the thought of living here in a little apartment or a cottage. And the answer is, not a lot. Nothing much. Frankly, <laughs> there are stages. This is, this is common thought in uh, Indian spirituality. You'll have to forgive me, I'm going to refer to men now. But it's the same for women. There are stages in a man's life. Childhood, uh, de where he's dependent, sort of youth where he's making his way in the world, establishing himself. In our, in our case in the West, trying to be someone, <laughs> trying to be successful, defined usually by somebody else, you will notice. Oh gosh, how much psychological effort and money goes into 
trying to be someone, a successful someone in the West. Been there, done that. Ah. And then there's this, there's a maturity where the kids have grown up and uh, the husband uh, leaves the family and takes off into the woods and becomes a sannyasin, uh, an itinerant beggar with just a begging bowl and a stick and uh, a loincloth. That's me <laughs> in, a, in a year's time. Well, I'm at that age now, frankly. I should just be walking like Ramana Maharshi in a nappy. <laughs> Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Uh, uh, I have actually meditated for many hours in the cave where Ramana Maharshi lived for, I think it was six or seven years. He grew his fingernails and everything. He didn't need to uh, make a success of himself. But is uh, revered through the age, well, through the ages. I think he died in something like in the 1950s. But uh, there's a great tradition of what's called Advaita or non duality, not two, uh, which sprang from that single act of uh, devotion to what is the one that is and from that tradition sprang Papaji and from Papaji sprang Muji <laughs> and after Muji uh, everybody seems to have their own YouTube channel on non-duality now <laughs> uh, good friend of mine who uh, came on a retreat to Bakewell. Actually, no, that's not true. He came to uh, he came to film John in Bakewell. Matt Garrett. He's got his own non-duality YouTube channel now. Check him out. He's very good. And uh, there's an American Baptist pastor called Marshall Davis. Change arms and getting tired. Marshall Davis on YouTube, Christian non duality. Uh, absolutely wonderful. It's both biblically um, mm, proper, if, uh, uh, no, true to scriptures, but uh, he interprets, because of course we all interpret our Christian spirituality according to what we've been told. Buenos dias. Gracias. And uh, Marshall Davis sticks to the biblical truths but um, gives a very fresh uh, and I find insightful interpretation of the life and sayings of Jesus who he whom he regards as um, an Advaita master if I could put it that way uh, a a demonstrator of the I am and the the unity of the kingdom of God which was Jesus's message and on this Good Friday morning again I'm I'm riffing here but I've been thinking about what Jesus and Easter his death and resurrection represents and it all sort of starts in the Garden of Eden and we say it was an apple but basically we don't know it's just the fruit, no takar, do not touch. What was that fruit? The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Now, it is really interesting to note that whilst we remember that part of the story, the don't touch, there is a do touch part of that story, which is ignored. I don't think I've heard anybody preach or write about the fact that God said, you may eat the fruit of any tree of the garden, any tree of the garden, except for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now this has intrigued me because the, oh, the only other specifically named fruit tree is the tree of life or the tree of eternal life. So right there and then in the garden, eternal life was not withheld from Adam and Eve. So what was the calamity? You have to bear in mind that uh, by definition, um, because they were told not to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, um, by definition, they did not know what good and e evil was. <laughs> and so they did not know uh, what disobedience was. They had no concept of it. Up until that point, um, they walked daily in the uh, in the cool of the afternoon in in the garden with God. No separation. Uh, naked. No sense of uh, self awareness. Just union with God uh, as intended. So what was this? Um, instruction not to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil all about well it's it's the beginning of duality what we call duality good evil right wrong good bad I like this I don't like that I want I don't like I desire I avoid duality and this to me is what represents the fall it's not the fall in ethics it's not it's not disobedience per se because they knew it's a bit of a uh, a cheap trick to play on your kids um, I want you to be good but they but they don't uh, they don't even know what the difference between good and not good but anyway, this, this fall from grace, if you like, of unity with God was a fall into separation of like and don't like. And why was this so, so devastating that they, they got them thrown out of the garden? It's because of the, the, the fall in consciousness of divine union. It sort of broke the spell, not the spell, the reality of union with God into separation. And the word, so we're, we're not very familiar with the word sin these days. And I think we have a, we, we get hold of the wrong end of the stick with sin. Especially thanks to St. Augustine, the idea of original sin, which is not in the Bible, certainly not in Genesis, chapters 1, 2 and 3. The word sin doesn't actually appear in Genesis until Cain kills Abel. So this idea of original sin, of the disobedience of for basically scrumping. It's, it's a fairly harsh sentence for scrumping. You will die. You will live by the sweat of your brow. You'll, give, you'll have pain in childbirth for scrumping. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the God I walk with in the cool of the, well, in the growing heat of the morning here 
on the Camino on Easter Good Friday morning. I notice I'm walking in the shade already. Now this, uh, uh, as I understand it, the, the meaning behind a sin is to miss the mark, as in archery, the arrow misses the red center, misses the bull, or you could say it misses the point. And the point being that we miss the fact, through our natural conditioning, the way we grow up, we miss the point that we are not separate from the divine. Now, even the evangelical Christianity that I chose to uh, throw my loss in, so to speak, with, with enthusiasm and, and with no regret, um, that there's no mystical aspect to that in terms of uh, union with God. It's, it's hugely presumptuous, of course, because we, we are the creature, you see. The immediate separation in that sort of Christian theology, which I can no longer adhere to, is just what we were taught. I, I don't want to chew somebody else's theological cud anymore. And the other thing that we mistake about sin is we confuse the metaphysics for the ethics. By that I mean sin is a, a tectonic shift in metaphysics, which is what is reality. So the reality was union with God and they walked uh, in, the, in, the, in the garden with God naked because they had no self-consciousness, no separate self-consciousness. It was learned. And so sin is a metaphysical idea of this union with God being broken. It's a sort of a legal a legal state, if you like. It's a bit like uh, if you're caught by, speed, by a camera speeding, um, you may very well be fined. It's, it's, it's just the law. So it doesn't make you a bad driver. Well, maybe it does if you do it regularly, like, no, I won't say like, like my brother. But if, hello again. Juan Camino. Mari Lucy, thank you. Hasta luego. And this, um, this metaphysical sin is like una multa, a par <laughs> parking fine. No, no, I can't say that. That, uh, that doesn't really. It's like if uh, breaking the law speeding does not make you an inherently evil person. Uh, so the other meaning of sin that, that we take it to be, and it's particularly banded around, if I may say so, in the Catholic Church, but that might be really unfair because I think the only Catholic churches I've been in are on the Camino. Uh, the past two times and this time just now. Um, sin is seen as an ethical failure of each person. We are born into sin. Well, I can, I can buy that born into sin in terms of, shall we say, the metaphysics of being separate from the union with God, but not born into sin as <laughs> vile, evil, fallen, nasty, diseased creatures. No, 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 no. Goodness me. That's throwing God's creation back in his face, it seems to me. We're children of God. There's, a, there's that lovely verse in the Gospels where Jesus says, 
which of you fathers, when asked by his children for a loaf of bread, would give them a stone? Well, this is the, this is the God I know. And I really don't think this divine presence, this, this benign, loving God, for, to whom is loving Heavenly Father, uh, is trying to pull a fast one uh, over us and throwing us a stone instead of a loaf at every opportunity because we're bad children. That doesn't stack up to me. This does, look at this. Look at this lovely planted wood here, cops on the way. Oh, what a delightful morning. And the other thing, and I'll shut up after this, that I've been musing is, sin is, particularly in the evangelical tradition, which is what I'm more familiar with. Um, sin is seen as, yes, separation from God. And Jesus is seen as the bridge. Uh, and in one of the images that I, that I learned or saw when I was a, a young born again Christian is think of a, a ravine. On one side is God and on the other is you or man. And we're separated from God because of sin. And the cross, if you imagine it, if you know the game of Tetris, moving the blocks about, uh, a cross-shaped Tetris piece, the cross of Christ, slots into the ravine and acts as a bridge between us and God. Well, that's partly helpful, but it, it sort of continues, it almost reaffirms, in my mind, the separation. And that if it wasn't for Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, uh, we're, you know, there but for the grace of Christ go I. But this doesn't go far enough for me. It's not, as the, as the evangelicals like to say, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Well, it takes two to relationship. And Jesus' invitation, he says, okay, I call you friends. But his prayer was that we might become one, like the branches and the vine. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Well, you can't really say it's a relationship. <laughs> there is no vine without the branches. Uh, we are embedded with the vine. That's who we are. And this is my understanding of the meaning of Easter, that we are redeemed back to our original place in the garden of no separation. Just don't go scrumping.